Welcome to the Friday Power Lunch, a weekly show amplifying the voices of the Virginia grassroots. Each week, we provide engaging conversations about politics, culture, and women making change. Produced by the unstoppable women of Network Nova, our motto is, when we vote, we win. The Friday Power Lunch is recorded before a live Zoom audience. Follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and show us some love and become a sponsor through Patreon. The Friday Power Lunch, badass women getting things done. I am so glad it's Friday. The primary in Virginia is behind us. So power to the people because our democracy worked in Virginia. The voices of the voters were heard. And that is the power of a healthy democracy. It is the vote. When we vote, we, we win. win. I love it. And that's people power. Because in Virginia, you know, when we have that, just two years of majority, we pass voting rights. We pass things to protect reproductive rights and get rid of the bad trap laws and all that. And that was important what we did because what we find now is that how great it is that the voting in Virginia is just accessible. It, you know, you can early vote and then we have same day registration. And that is really, again, the power of the people. And we see in other states, and I know David Pepper's here from Ohio. He's going to talk about this later, how that gerrymandering and redistricting and the restricting of our voices around that vote really, uh, really just leads to corruption in politics. So we're excited he's here with us today. And the power of the people, we see La Charisse aired here. Let's give her a big chair. Woo! All right. She made it through that primary because that spoke loudly about the character of the candidates, the character of the, the values that we want people to carry down to the General Assembly and what is on the ballot. So we're so glad she's here today to celebrate this that Senate race. And um, also about media, how our voice matters, how we figure out what the values are going on. We have also Ricky here, Conray from Harmony Labs. We're so excited to talk to her later. So tonight, you know, this is why we're going to fight like hell. We're facing this anniversary. I don't like to call it an anniversary, but the 365 days almost later tomorrow of Dobbs being overturned, the follow row and how that impacts women. Right now we see what is happening across the state. So it is really gonna take the power of the people to make sure that we, we worked to overturn that and we keep Virginia uh, safe. You know, so thank you for being here today. Power to you, power to the people in the room, right on, and let's get perked up and ready to go. I'm Catherine White, your host, bringing you the guests, the issues, the action, all in one room to fuel the grassroots community, to get things done, and yes, to have politics and have a lot of fun. And today, this week, power to the people. Let's talk about democracy. And today we added in uh, also, let's talk about dogs. Let's talk about Virginia elections. And everybody in the room, I know you're thinking about the primary. I would love if you put in the chat um, where you live, if you're in Virginia, who won your primary and maybe what that, if that excites you. I got a call from an activist who said to me, uh, a friend who's just been in the movement a long time and said, this is the first time I've, I've in, a, in a year, so I feel really excited about elections. This primary has just energized people. So uh, so go ahead. But I'd love to see uh, how excited you are. Maybe there's some disappointment. Sure. We love it. All right. I um, today want to say that we know who's on. We have David Pepper here from Ohio. We will be bringing him up later. He is just a wonderful author. If you haven't read his book, uh, Laboratories of Autocracy, well, you got some reading to do, and he's going to share some thoughts about saving democracy today. Ricky Conray is here, a, the science director from Harmony Labs, about using science and data and creativity and research to reshape our relationship with media. That's going to be fascinating. So I'm pretty excited about that. And of course, we're going to kick it off uh, with La Charisse Aird is here. And But before we do, I want to make sure that we know there's new people in the room. You're on, uh, this is Network Nova's media channel, the Friday Power Lunch, and that we have the rules of the road. It's basically, you know, be cool, be civil in the chat. If you get really, really offensive or nasty, we'll boot you out. We have the big boss here. Happy anniversary, big boss. I know you've been married, what, 47 years or something. That's amazing. 
So um, she'll boot you out because she's feeling happy, but she'll do it. All right, after chat, well, after one o'clock, we love to get into the after chat. And I know some of our guests are gonna be staying to share what you're doing, hear from them and ask some in-depth questions. And also lastly, support the show. This is what we do, become a patron. I have my button today, I don't have my coffee cup. Um, so become a patron, five, $10 a month. It really keeps the lights on. So that's it. I'm gonna, I'm so excited just to jump into it. So for now, Norton, MC, co-host, wonderful TikToker. How are you doing today? I am doing just fine today. I'm feeling particularly excited today too, because I am so happy that La Charisse is here. Yeah. And I am so excited about this topic today. And I think her being here is, is part of this. It is about democracy. This is what this is all about. This is what democracy looks like. And <laughs> I know, you know, with the Virginia elections, I put a whole sheet out here looking at, you know, all these wins. Um, We saw some really great wins with, uh, for, I think, really what people want to see a, a more diverse legislator or just, you know, some, some shakeups we had is in like uh, the race in 37 between Chad Peterson and Salam, Saddam Salim. He's going to be on NPR like at noon today. We had such an interesting race there. There was a couple of nail biters that we saw, uh, you know, across, across, we can get into that later, but today is we're going to shine the light on La Charisse if we want to bring her up and let's just, I would love to share. Yeah, let me just fix my screen too. So, hello. There you are. There she is. Uh, can you yeah. hear me? I could hear you. So, how are you feeling? Let's talk about. Let's talk about this past year for you. And and here you are, made it through this primary. Yes. Thank you so much. First and foremost, Catherine, for the invitation to uh, participate in this power uh, lunch hour this Friday, but also to the entire Network Nova team for continuing to convene us around critically important conversations here, uh, both in Virginia, but quite frankly, um, around uh, the country as we are sharing some of these uh, challenging issues that we're faced with. Um, I can't be anything more than excited uh, coming off of the high of this Tuesday and the success not that I have had, but that we collectively have had. And I have to start with saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I see a lot of amazing friends on the call, both in Virginia and out of Virginia, that played a huge role in helping get us across the finish line. And there was not one moment where I felt like this was just a race for the voters solely of Senate District 13. There were so many fantastic volunteers and people that said we are taking ownership of this race from around the Commonwealth of Virginia because it affects all of us. And so uh, there is just a warm heart on this end and a big, big thanks to uh, everyone who played even the smallest role uh, in allowing us to be successful. Um, I have to say that top of mind, and you'll talk more about this today, is certainly being on the eve of the anniversary of the Dobbs decision. Uh, many of you know I announced my candidacy in March of 2022 uh, because regardless of anything, my opponent was not fit to serve. But I have to be honest and say, when we saw uh, Dobbs overturned in June, it became far more personal and far more critical. And the one uh, thought that I am left with is just how critically important state legislatures are becoming, how critically important it is here in Virginia, what happens with our House and with our Senate. And we attempted to cement reproductive rights uh, here and access to an abortion here in Virginia and our constitution during the 2023 session. And we were unable to do that. We have another opportunity to get that right during the uh, future sessions that are coming, but it starts with what we do in the interim and what happens in November. But I heard loud and clear from voters in this district that they value the role that their legislators have, because unfortunately, we cannot depend on those protections at the federal level. And so I take this responsibility very seriously. Uh, and I want to recommit to each and every one of you here publicly 
that the first thing I will be doing when we get uh, through November and into the next General Assembly session is working unapologetically to submit those protections as we all desire, as Virginians desire, as the voters of Senate District 13 desire. Uh, and the, you know, the last thing that I will just say, just in offering some reflections, is that as we head into November, um, I think all of the reproductive rights uh, organizations and coalitions that stood with me, um, all of uh, the organizations that are active here in Virginia, they would all say that the majority of Virginians believe in access to an abortion. And they believe in this issue as the issue as we head into November because it is intrinsically linked to all other issues. The one thing that I heard continuously during um, our campaign, knocking on doors and just talking to all types of people uh, in our rural communities and our suburban communities and our urban communities is when it comes to that decision of when you want to begin your family, you immediately begin to think about everything else. You begin to think about your schools. You begin to think about whether you're in a safe community. You begin to think about whether or not you have adequate housing. That is why this issue is the issue. It is because it's intrinsically linked to every other issue. And as we continue to campaign and have these conversations, it is so important that we not only reiterate that, but remind voters that abortion is on the ballot, but also all of the reproductive health care uh, spectrum issues are on the ballot. That's contraception. That's access to an abortion. Those are protections to combat infant and maternal mortality. It is all of those things that we are talking about. And that is absolutely why I know voters showed up in this race. Uh, they, they spoke loud and clear overwhelmingly in this race, and they will again in November uh, as we continue to push forward. Congratulations to all of the candidates that made it through uh, their primary successfully. I am looking forward to not only working hard to get through our race, but also to help fight to grow our majority in the Senate and take back the majority in the House. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. Woo, I'm gonna say round of applause. I think that, I mean, one thing we do know, you just summed it up just so brilliantly because the connection to the economic issues that Stacey Abrams had made the same argument and we made it here because a lot of people were saying, oh, well, you know, maybe we don't wanna push this issue too much, It's but it's a kitchen table issue, right? I mean- It absolutely is. And we, and we have to- it. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure to make that connection. We did that and, and people got it right away. Yeah, it's you really, it is. I mean, the, just that freedom to be able to make that choice. And, and also you see right now and today that you're going to watch it all day on the news, what's happening in other states with women and girls and health. And there's some real tragedies that are happening when you don't have this right. Mm -hmm. And so we're so grateful uh, that you were, ran and you stepped up and you really did fight like hell down there. And I would like to say the National Women's Political Caucus with Andrea Miller was really beating that drum. The Planned Parenthood with Jamie Lockhart, Helen Jones, you know, all the reproductive people in that space, uh, they showed up. They showed up. Yes, early. they did. Yes, they, they did. Early. So yeah, Fennell, any last comments before yeah, we- Yeah, I, 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 I do. I, I would say that LaShanice is our inspiration for today. And I also would like to use President Obama's words, but in this term to say that she did give him a shellacking, which is really a <laughs> yeah, and, and, a and I, She gave him a shellacking. And I, and I do want to say when you were talking about the stories that people tell, that is what's so important to make that connection. If you look today, there are stories in the New York Times and the Washington Post in uh, the Guardian, NPR, and there are all these powerful stories about women. And hopefully we'll drop those in the chat so that folks can can see them because when you make that connection, it softens people's yes. hearts. That's where this comes from, a place of empathy. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, you get some rest. I know you've been going strong. We are so Thank excited you. We <laughs> don't have people showing up for you and will continue to show up. But I do think it's important as we head into this, into the election, that we don't stay off this topic because the Republicans would like to leave this topic. 
and they would like to talk about their drag shows or banning books or, you know, I noticed the other day uh, after our win in the primary, our, our, our candidates were presented, they called us leftists and radicals and communists and social, whatever, they're a little ready. But I thought to myself, it's electing women and more people of color is radical to you or your party. Well, I'm all in. I'm, I guess you can call me that because electing women, electing more people of color, electing a diverse, I mean, Virginia, Democratic Party, I couldn't be prouder to be a part of our brand, um, that we just are trying to be inclusive and the candidate quality matters, the character that you have, what you brought to it matters. And this is what voters want. Their voices were heard and that's amazing. We had some nail biters and we had some really still, I don't know if some of the races, one race, if the Guzman race is even called yet, but we had some really great candidates and um, we really want to say thank you to everybody that ran for sure. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right. Big round of applause. Let's give some hands up. I see Joanne Luann here all the way from California. Great to see her. And we stay in the after chat, Joanne. And uh, I know that she probably is, she's going to be at the Women's Summit mm -hmm. giving all of our candidates some of the oppo research and different kind of support. So thank you for being here, Joanne. All right. I, I let's, what do you want to do? I'm out of breath. What do you think? Are you pretty excited? I mean, well, I'm yeah, I, I am thrilled. And so I am ready to get this show started. So uh, is David yeah. here? Yeah, I, I was just, you know, I wanted, yes, yes, David is, David is here all the way from Ohio. And I think later in the show, I would love to go over some of the results uh, with you about some of the races. And we saw, Lu, you know, Lu, uh, Louise Lucas, the mama gonna knock them out. She did yeah. and she won, you know, some exciting races to talk about later. And some, and like I said, real, some real nail, biter, nail biters as well. I was um, gonna say my mom doesn't even live in the district and she's boxing like Louise Lucas. So I'm just saying sometimes those powerful messages, they hit yeah. home. I mean, that that the, the Jeremy McPike and Elizabeth Guzman, I'm looking at 28 votes spread there that I'm not sure. And then, you know, some are totally blowouts and some are just really, really close, which says a lot. I just, I love that people got up and they voted and people cared. And there's some really great races to talk about. So stick with us later for that. But let's get to our Ohio friend, David Pepper, best-selling author, former local elected official, a political activist, former chair of the Democratic Party. And also you're one of the best political thrill writers on the scene. At least that's what the uh, Washington, I think Times calls it a street journal. I'm sorry. So how are you doing, David? I'm great. I, I can't compete with you guys, though. I've, you, every time you bring all this energy, but now coming off uh, Tuesday, it's even more electric than usual. So it, thanks electric. for lifting me up with your midday energy on a Friday. I got my shirt all in to win. When we vote, we win. And I'm in Ohio, Absolutely. too, by the way. I'm in Ohio. Uh -huh. I'm up in Cleveland, not. Oh, you are right now. Oh. Yeah, so I'm holding up the northern state. You're down there, and Cynthia. I'm actually in Columbus today, so this is why I've been. This, I have a very boring background. I'm borrowing an office from somebody. Oh well, okay. Well, we're glad you're here, and the reason why we're here is we really wanted to shape this show, saving democracy. Democracy, and it so so happens that is your area of of really we've been following. So just um, to give some people in the room that may not be familiar with your background. Um, you know, you are a writer, as we said, and one of the books that we had you on before was The Laboratories of Autocracy. And then now you've written this, we call the User's Manual, Saving Democracy, which I just love how you followed it up with. Let's, why don't you just give us the background? And I think Lesherie's talked about it, how important legislators are. And you were the one ringing, sounding that alarm. Give us some front on why this is so important, why yeah. you wrote this book, why you're ringing that bell, and then we're, we'll talk later a little bit more about what's going on. Sure, yeah. I mean, you guys you guys are living it, and this is why there's no, nothing more important this year in American politics than flipping that state house blue in Virginia. And I'll be, you, I'll be uh, your ally in helping to do that all year long. And why is that so important? Because the front line of the right wing's attack on democracy is not Washington, although they, they want to have power there, they understand, and we're seeing it play out at hyper speed right now, unfortunately, they understand that um, they can do the most damage to democracy in state houses, because state houses control every issue we care about, like a woman's right to choose or the regulation of guns or what, what's taught in schools. 
But state houses also draw the rules of our democracy. And with those rules are, are the power to create a representative democracy with accountability or the power to rig elections so there's no accountability. That's what they're doing around the country. And why? Because they know, as, as I hopefully will show in the coming months in Virginia, they know that most of their worldview is deeply unpopular. Abortion bans, no exceptions. Book bans, gun laws that, that basically allow everything to happen, that we're seeing the violence. Those are all really unpopular things. Mm -hmm. So they realize if they try and win in a regular healthy democracy on an agenda that's deeply unpopular, they know they will lose. So they need to find a way to lock in a minority worldview that is sustained over time that, that, that would otherwise lose in a democracy. Well, the way you do that is win state houses, gerrymander the hell out of them, suppress the vote of the o Obama coalition that's a threat to you, and then you can pass all the extremism in the world that you want and you get away with it. And that's what's happening all over the country right now. That, that was sort of the reason I wrote the first book from Ohio saying, hey, everyone, this is what we're going through. And so is Missouri. And so is Tennessee and all these states. So while we all love to focus on federal elections, it's those uncontested races in all these other states that are actually the way that ultimately they're doing the most damage. So that's where we should focus. And you'll be glad to know, and I'll stop talking. People, I got a lot of good, good feedback on my first book, but a lot of it was, oh my God, that's so depressing. All the details are so depressing. What can we do about it? And I heard it so much, I thought, okay, I'm going to write a second book. Read the first book to see the problem. The second book is everything that every one of us could do about it. And, and why do I say every one of us? Because once you realize this isn't about some swing state somewhere, but the attack on democracy is in every state, red or blue, the good news about that very sad conclusion is there's so much we can all do about it if we figure out that we have a role to play. And so this book goes through, as it says, a user's manual, take on those unchallenged extremists in the Tennessee legislature, Virginia, uh, take on the book banners on school boards, start signing up for elections officials' offices. I go through all the best practices of what we can do in the second book. Oh, But, the, but we're all on the front line in this year. No one is more on the front line of democracy than Virginia. And that's why I'm really excited to join you today and to keep working with you well, all year long. No, it's true. And I think, again, when I, I think back to the story and the book you wrote, well, and really starting to pay attention to the state legislatures and Democrats, we tend to just be really fascinated, like you said, with the federal level, the presidential, but we're really now learning. And I thanks to you and your voice in this, we spread this around. And Virginia, I think we kind of, well, it was sort of not the roll of the dice, but what happened to us, I think that we actually flipped blue when other people went red, is it just so happened we had an election um, back when, you know, when, when Trump got elected and we had an election and all of us in this room, a lot of the activists stepped up and, the, and we filled these seats that weren't filled before. And like you talk about that run everywhere, contest yeah. everywhere, don't let it, don't cede ground to anybody, right? I mean, that's really an important lesson. Absolutely. One, one of the things that I, I, I cite you guys in my first book, you did a much better job in, I think, both 17 and 19 of running everywhere. You had far more with the diversity of candidates that reflect our country and our party. It was very important, I think, and it is again this time, that when you look at the Democratic candidates, it reflects our, our, our great diversity as a country. And so you, what you achieved in 17, 19, winning the majority through multiple years was a really important lesson for everyone else. And, and my only, you know, and I think there's been a decent job done this time, but to the extent you can still fill every single seat in Virginia so right. that every, you know, why are they getting so extreme? Because in so many of these states, not only are they gerrymandered, we're not running against anybody. 50% of the Tennessee Republicans who voted out the two Justins, 50% of them, no opponent in the prior election. Um, in Texas and Georgia and Ohio, millions of people are showing up to vote for state house. They don't even have a choice. And when politicians feel zero accountability, the only incentive they feel is to be more extreme. And so uh, gerrymandering is terrible. We have to solve right. it. But we make things worse when we allow people to run with no opposition. And so one of my calls to action in my book, whether it's in Virginia, whether it's all over the country, is run everywhere and value running everywhere. So when people do, we step up and help them 
and we don't walk away from them because it happens to be a tough race. We thank them for stepping up and being great patriots by running. And then we surround them with support. And if they don't win, we thank them again. Because even if they didn't win, they may have looked at turnout. They probably did if they knocked on the right doors. And they held an extremist accountable for the first time that extremist probably had any accountability in years. Yeah. And I think what we need to do is keep, this is a great thing. We know it and we, we should really act on it because we, what would I see is what Republicans do is they, they kind of learn from it and they, we see them running everywhere. We see them running more women, try to run more diverse candidates. And so literally this is our space where we should be excelling at this. And especially in Virginia and going back to why I really think we are kind of the only Southern state left with these rights for women for reproductive access, you know, um, it's because we are able to build that blue wall because all these diverse candidates stood up and it excited the electorate. And like you said, the first time people, how important the vote is, and we saw that in the primary, the people to exercise that and actually after the win to realize that that, that does matter. And we went through redistricting. So this was David, it was voter education and there's still voters were confused because we're all redistricted, all the numbers are different and there was a lot of uh, opportunity to bring some new fresh voices down there at, down to the General Assembly. So we're excited about that. But I wanna talk a little bit, you know, going a little bit further with this, what's happening in Ohio. So what we saw let's in Kansas where they put the ballot initiative on, initiative on. we saw in Michigan where they put the ballot initiative on. Initiative on. And then they're getting, and so what Republicans are seeing this and what are they doing? What's happening? Now that they see the ballot initiative oh. used so everybody has the voice to vote, what do you see happening? So what we see, so the irony is, and it, it, so the minute irony. Dobbs came out, which was one year ago plus a, a day, okay? It was right. the 24th. So I just did one of my new whiteboards. Every, if anyone follows me, I do all these whiteboards. I did one where I'm almost more livid than any other whiteboard because when Dobbs came out, Mm -hmm. I said the minute I read it, this is complete gaslighting because they wrote, I think it was Alito who wrote, well, once we strike down uh, the right to have an abortion as a constitutional right, this will mean that the quote, citizens of each state will now be in charge. Then they wrote, the, this will quote, return that authority to the people of the states to decide. Mm -hmm. What bullshit part? I don't know if yeah. I'm allowed to no, say You're allowed to say so. bullshit. Yeah, okay. what bullshit. They knew it was bullshit because yeah, they, they know that that decision is not going to the people. It's going to gerrymandered legislatures, mm -hmm. half of them are not opposed, who are extremists, who do the opposite of what the people want. Sorry, I'm getting a little fired up right now. No, it's okay. Get Almost fired up. every state in this country supports a woman's right to choose. Mm -hmm. No state supports abortion bans, no exceptions. Nobody does. That's toxic. This went back to states, to extremist legislatures, who put into place the opposite of what the people wanted in the Dobbs decision majority knew that was going to happen. And what's happening in Ohio now is the people are doing like they did in Kansas and Michigan, exactly what Dobbs said. We are trying to gather signatures to get it on the ballot. And we will pass it if we are allowed to do that, because more than half. 59% of Ohioans support a woman's right to choose. 10% or fewer supported what happened to that rape victim who was sent to Indiana. Yeah. Because we have a ban, no exception. That is absolutely toxic here. And what are they doing now that we are doing what the court said, which is let the citizens decide? They're changing the very rules of the Constitution itself to raise the level of 60% to keep the majority of the citizens of Ohio from having their will and their belief expressed in the Ohio Constitution. It's outrageous. And it, it's one of the reminder, one, that, the, that it all, it's all about state houses. Right. But two, these state houses are rigged. They're gerrymandered. And we have to fight everywhere to stop that. And three, how broken our Supreme Court is that mm -hmm. they are literally intentionally gaslighting the country by having an opinion literally saying disingenuously, oh, this will magically go back to the people. It, 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 the, the only difference, and you're one exception, but the only difference between states that now have abortion bans, no exceptions, and those that don't, isn't the citizens of these states, because no citizens support those things. It's, are you in a very gerrymandered legislature or aren't you? And if you're a state with one, abortion is illegal or it's caught up in the courts, and if you're a state that's not a, a, a gerrymandered by extremists, 
you can have you have access. This is all coming down to broken state houses. And the minute we try and change it, they're changing the rules. They are scared to death of the citizens weighing in. Yeah. And okay, it, that, so no, I'll get off my soapbox now, but no, you stay the on this. decision you is just atrocious when no. it comes to how they try to politicize the outcome. You and have to stay on the so soapbox. You have to stay on there because I think that's what I would, you know, it would harkens to mind like the Tennessee three. And I think, you know, what we've really understood is when there's injustice, we have to shine the spotlight on it so people can see the naked raw the, the naked raw stealing of power. And I think most people look at what's happening in Ohio and go, that is so messed up. And I'm so, um, you know, it's really great to see people showing up and fighting this, but it's, they shouldn't have to, like you said, the people are these elected, this, this corruption that's going on in Ohio, that they, they don't want people's voices to be heard, right? You can, it, it's amazing that yeah. this is what they do, nakedly out just doing it. Yeah, we, we have it. We had they literally it's an illegal election. Yes. The, the state legislature about five months ago passed a law saying, well, because no one votes in August special elections, it's a waste of money. It's not good for democracy. So we're banning August special elections. OK, they made it illegal. Right. And a few months later, activists began to collect signatures for a November election like Kansas mm -hmm. to enshrine the, the, a woman's right to choose in the Ohio Constitution. Well, the legislature that had just banned August elections decided, well, um, we have to get in front of a referendum that we know we will lose just like Kansas. Right. And so we are now having, we are now having a special election on a date where it is illegal to have a special election. In August, right? In August, <laughs> they tried to have a vote to rescind the law making illegal and it didn't pass. They didn't have enough votes. So they're just, they just passed a resolution saying, we're gonna have it on that date anyway. And our very tainted Supreme Court four to three said, that's okay, they're allowed to break their own law. So the whole thing is illegal, Yes. but that's how, but they are desperate it's going back to that Dobbs language, I just put a quote up here. They are so desperate to keep the citizens from weighing in, they are breaking the law to have an election to get in the way. Because again, at 50%, a, a, a referendum on choice would pass. 60%, it gets tough. Mm -hmm. the, the polling is about 58% supported. It would pass. They know it. They are changing the rules in advance, jumping in line. And by the way, here's the opportunity, though. Before we flip you guys blue in, in Virginia in August, help us crush this thing. I'm right. sorry, in November, we're going to flip you blue. We need the nation to say next up in the battle for democracy after Kansas referendum, after last November, we won state house as the secretary of state's office. After April, we win the Wisconsin Supreme Court race, right? Right. Next up, Ohio. Destroy this thing in August. Then next up, Virginia flip it blue in November, and then just keep right on going to, through yeah. next year. I That's how we have to think about the battle for democracy. It's everywhere all the time. Well, it's everywhere all the time. And our winds at the sales, uh, in our sales, I'm, I have that feeling we, you know, again, keeping on the soapbox, keeping the spotlight on it, because it's really important for people to see it. And just to wrap this up, and I want to talk about your, your book, I want to say to people, return to what people can do, a few things. Like when you're talking about what you see happening and you know you wrote this manual, just a few things again, what people can do. And I just wanna bring up one more thing. We also talked about the Jim Crow laws that came after you know, the Civil War. And I feel like we're sort of in this time where maybe this is what it felt like then, where things were just moving and they're trying to shut down rights. And there must be some analogy in your book with ways people like you had mentioned, people didn't have rights, they didn't have the right to vote, but still changed. They were still able to make change somehow, even without that, right? Well, yeah, they understood, and this is sort of yeah. the theme of the book. It's sort of, I'm getting to a lot here. Almost, uh, we have viewed the last 40 years through a, a privileged lens that the democracy is magically intact. Right. And that has been a terrible error. And that's why we thought, well, we're just going to focus on federal elections because democracy is fine. And if we win those elections, we're fine. The truth is that was a mistake. We are in a battle for democracy itself. And once we see it that way, we see it like the suffragists saw it or John Lewis saw it, like Stacey Abrams saw in Georgia. Mm -hmm. It's a never ending battle. It involves elections, but it involves more than elections. It involves 
a constant struggle. And that's how we should plan for it. That's how we should stick with it. That's how we should assess it. And that's why I said, it's not just about November of 24. It's about August of 23, November of 23. It's about recruiting all the time to fill every seat, all of that stuff. And once you see that, the other good news is you're seeing it in the right frame. Right. You're seeing it's not only about a few swing states. Virginia happens to be one right now. That's good for you. Right. But it's about the fact that when I went to Oklahoma, they're begging for help. They're begging for attention. In New York, we take it for granted because they're a blue state. Their turnout is so low, they, use, they lose house races. They should never lose. The battle for democracy is in blue states, red states, not only purple states. Everywhere. And um, yeah. But once you see that, and this is what the book goes through, there are so many specific things you can do where you live since you are on the front line. It's not just a swing state somewhere. Whether, again, every single uncontested race is a disaster. So recruit. Beginning, you know, you guys, I think, still have a few days where you can recruit in yeah. some, but make sure that every district, every extremist faces opposition. Yes. Uncontested races are killing us. School board races, front lines, front line for democracy races. Keep going. Um, and then there are all, I'm going to put some links down here. If you want yeah. to help in Ohio, there are virtual yeah. phone banks you can do. We need to have sort of a democracy army that parents in. We, that's why we want, we have a winning streak going because yeah. people have started to see this. Again, Kansas, last November, Wisconsin, Ohio, then you guys, we all have to, when, when we see that democracy is in trouble lately, we get fired up enough to put money into it and to put time into it. And that's why, again, that's why every sector of state running who was an election, election, election denier last November in a swing state, they all lost. Because yes, people it, figure it out. We have to just keep going and going and going. Well, I think you you years. have the room fired up. And with that, I want to get to uh, de, about your book and the Democracy Challenge and about what we're doing in Virginia, which is going to be a, our women's summit for everybody. It's open to all, as we say, all woke folk. Our, our, our great summit is to call attention to what's on the ballot, which is really democracy. So to get that energy in this room and to get people to come to our event, we have Simon Rosenberg who's coming, who's actually building that grassroots army. A lot of people are in that with him on the Hopian Chronicles. We have such great speakers that are going to be there all weekend. Uh, for now, we're going to get excited. So today, what we want to do to our, the, with the audience here, everybody in the room, to tell you about this great event we're doing. July 22nd and 23rd. And we want you to come and we want more people to come. We want new people to come. We need that fire in the belly to save democracy. So today we're gonna to do a ticket challenge with David Pepper. David has generously donated three of his signed copies of his new book to the winners of this challenge who will help us sell tickets to our summit because we, we want more and more people to go. And when we get together, we meet in person, oh my God, just it, it, the spark happens. So we'll have all the candidates here, like La Charisse will be there, uh, you know, just amazing uh, list of candidates. So Robin, why don't you talk about the, how we're going to do the challenge and this and get people in the room excited to be part of this challenge. Will do. All right. So we need to build our dem democracy army, like um, David yeah. just said. And to do that, we need to get new people involved. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is to reach out to your family, friends, your networks, and get them to come to the Women's Summit. Because the Women's Summit is where we find our fire in the belly. We get excited. That incredible feeling you felt right after um, to, when you felt Tuesday night, when we were just winning across the board, you get a whole weekend of that incredible energy. So the way the challenge is going to work is we have a special promo code called Women um, WS Challenge, and we want you to invite your friends, your network to come to the Women's Summit with a special promo code to get the ticket at 149 because you know the ticket prices have gone up to 169 so you get a discount. And the way you get credit for it is there is a box on the registration form that says referral. So people, you have them put your name in it. The top ticket sellers get these coveted signed books by David Pepper of his book, Saving Democracy. And not only do you get his incredible book, but you're going to get a basket full of amazing Friday Power Lunch Women's Summit swag. Woo, 
swag. So you're going to have a whole basket full of incredible activist swag. Because what is better than not only feeling great about being an activist, but helping build um, this democracy, saving democracy army. So love that. your challenge is reach out to your friends, your net, send emails to your networks, go on social media, invite people to come to the Women's, Challenge, Women's Summit, give them this code so they can um, get it at the discount or they can pay full price. Well, that's great too. But have them write your name in the referral. And next week, we will announce the winner. And who doesn't want to be a winner and be <laughs> applauded by your friends um, in the grassroots? So I'm going to stop that. We're going to send an email out after the show explaining it again. Yeah, and I went ahead and put, if you want to look over our program, uh, our list of speakers, I just put the link in. But what's really cool, I wanted, for people that don't know about Network Nova, this is our seventh season going into this, and we just really believe is the power of the people, and that is how we get things done. What's really great, we'll be focusing on a lot with public education. We have Ann Holton who was speaking, and also Tim Kane will be there, Abigail Spamberger. We have leaders in this thought movement around all these issues that matter. Um, and it's really cool, the postcarding events at the summit will have like, the, the, whole, the workshops around it is amazing if you go to the website just to see what we've put together for postcarding. And of course, you know, we have a grassroots rise up event on Friday. We have uh, Saturday night, Saturday evening, a candidate will be having all the candidates take the stage. It is this super exciting. And then ending with the badass brunch on Sunday. And you can play and plug. Uh, some people are coming in like Mary Rarick from Oregon. We have local people here who will be staying at the hotel. So please join us, look over our program. It is exceptional. We have over 35 workshops. There's almost too much to talk about. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, I, I wanted to just jump in and say, because I am like so inspired by David right now. So that means you have to figure out what is it that you can do. And he's already given a, a, a few things you can do. But coming together builds solidarity. And every single one of us have the power that, that somebody else in your circle of friends needs to hear this message so that they can go out and deliver it to you. And by the way, David, the book really is phenomenal. And Catherine, I will take a privilege. There is one uh, thing that David has in his book, and I, and I have to read it because it says, here's what you say, David. You said, don't skip or speed read this quote. Go back, take it in every word. So here it is. Freedom is not a state. It's not an act. It's not the same enchanted garden perched high on a distant plateau where we finally sit down and rest. Freedom is a continuous action we all must take, and each generation must do its part to create an even more fair, more just society. John Lewis. So coming to the summit is your opportunity not to sit down. Everybody has to get up and do something, and this is the something. I love it. All right. Okay, David. Well, thank you for being with us, David. Thank you. I, I love joining you guys. I wish I could be at that summit in person because I'd love to get to Virginia sometime in person in the coming months. So. Well, we're yeah. going to invite you. You, told, you said maybe uh, we would get you down here when it comes time, to, especially closer to the fall. We, we will definitely awesome. get you down here. All right. Thank you, David. I Thanks, know you everybody. Have, keep, you fighting, a, keep fighting away. Take care. Will. Thank you. Stay in touch. And I'm going to turn it over to you for now because I'm so excited about what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Catherine. I am so excited too. And so I, I, I think that I've been so enamored with this whole idea of democracy as we keep talking about it. And so that's why I'm so excited to have Ricky Connery with us because she works for Harmony Labs and she does, talks about a lot of things. They study lots of things, but one that I'm particularly interested in is how they have thought about democracy. So Ricky, I'm going to let you just start for a minute and talk about the way that you guys have studied and the work that you've done around democracy to give everybody here a way to sort of think about it. I want them to walk away and I want us to scratch our heads and think about how we talk about it. We are in a very now for something completely different moment. So here we go. Um, so at Harmony Labs, we are interested in the power of story to shape societies, right? So we study how media affect people and we help storytellers harness media and create content that shapes a positive future. A lot of that is American future. And we think a lot 
about democracy. This like small d democracy. And so the first thing I want us to do is think about uh, the first pillar of democracy, which is representation. And then I want us to put it down because we're 47 minutes in. So we should talk about some of the other pillars of democracy. One of the big things that we've found in studying how the word democracy shows up in the media people see is that it shows up once every two years. Mm -hmm. um, and that is because our opportunity to participate in our own representation, if it happens at all, as David said, lots of times voters show up and they don't have a choice at the polls, which kind of sucks. But if it happens at all, it mostly happens in those midterm and uh, presidential federal elections. But there are three other pillars of a functioning democracy and they are equity, freedom, and justice. It is arguably the case that the problem with our democracy isn't not enough people showing up to vote. Turnout in general elections has been rising steadily since the 80s and turnout in the last presidential was the highest that it has been in 120 years, which is amazing. Like that's it, the work got done, people showed up, but it's not enough because the democracy is still in trouble. And one important reason for that, Pew found, we did not, Pew Research Center found that internationally, the symptom of a democracy faltering is not that people just think it needs reform, it's that people think it can't be reformed. That, that is not a voting problem. That's a story problem. That's a narrative problem. That's an understanding problem of what a democracy is, that it's an always on responsibility and that we can all be contributing to it every single day, not just every couple of years. Telling those stories, getting them into the culture is a narrative problem and every narrative problem at its heart is an audience problem. So we do a lot of work around audiences where we are not talking about demographic groups and we're not talking about issue positions. We're talking about audiences of people who go and sit in front of the same show and watch the same content, like li literal audiences. What are they getting? What are they seeking? What do they want that they aren't getting? And how can we put it there for them so that they can consume exactly what they want mm -hmm. to consume where they're spending time? So that's the jam. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's bigger than news. It's bigger than paid digital. It's in the culture all the time. How do we make a democracy story that reaches people where they are and resonates with how they want the democracy to work? So how we do it, Ricky? I need to know. Uh, there's a question. <laughs> um, we work with partners who do it all kinds of ways. The answer is, however, you're good at telling stories, you should tell stories. So we have partners um, working to tell stories through memes and gifts. We have partners who are making shows in Hollywood. We have partners who are writing songs. We have partners who are writing op-eds. We have, I guess we have some partners who are making paid digital ads. It's about doing what you're great at and targeting and connecting with an audience where they are from their perspective with what they want. We do have a specific way of looking at audience, which is the starting place. It's the easiest thing. So if Robin could stick that on the screen, we're only just gonna do this. We're not doing slides. I just wanna show you a picture. Okay. Uh, all right, so we think about these audiences with respect to their core values. A value is a goal. It's just a goal. So you could have shoes as a core value and many Americans, trust me, I study the media, definitely have Nike right at the center of their core values. But we use these values because they make a map that we can use to chart a course for democracy stories that resonate with every group. Um, almost everyone in this room is a people power. You can actually go to our website at uh, narrativeobservatory.org and find out the answer to this, but <laughs> Almost everyone in this room is a people power. People power people are we oriented, care about the collective, but they also want to create something new and promote something new and take a few risks and not so preserve and protect. I also heard somebody in the room say the word safety, which means that we also have some tough cookie energy here. Another way that people can show up in the world is by wanting to protect and preserve the social order. That is a good idea. We should do that. Those people are a little bit more about protecting and preserving than taking big risks, but they're still oriented to the collective. They still understand and want to engage in a group of people all working together. 
Um, I bet that there are some, if you say so, in this room, those folks, those folks still very into the idea of striving and creating, but they kind of want to do it on their own. So artists are often, if you say so, young people are often, if you say so. And then the final audience is authority or command oriented. Those are people who are individualistic, but want to work to protect and preserve what we have. These four values quadrants, and we can pull this off the screen now so that we can all look at each other. These four values quadrants are universal. Shalom Schwartz, a social psychologist from Israel, has tested these in 80 countries. And not everybody has all these values. That would be hard to hold. But every society has a functioning balance of all these values. And if you know who you want to talk to, if, for instance, you want to mobilize some voters, you're going straight to the autonomous, if you say so, audience, because they're the low vote prop people. Mm -hmm. You can start to shape not just where you go, that's important because they don't read the news, but also what you say to resonate with their values and what they want from their lives. So Ricky, a question. So I, I like the if you say so group. So can you just sort of talk about that just a little bit? Because those are everybody's people. We all know them. So just a little bit about what that could look like based on what you see. All right. You all know everyone. Everyone has some of these people in their lives. And when we, when we used uh, the strategy, like I, I voting to organize people into groups, it's hard to remember that actually that's my cousin or that's that uncle who always is upsetting at the Thanksgiving table. So thinking about it from the point of view of their values rather than their political actions or beliefs helps to establish some of the compassion you're going to need to tell stories. If you say so, is a big audience. It has lots of parts. So you can divide it up into little chunks, which is something we do a lot. It also um, has an overall orientation towards self-determination. This is an audience that wants to be autonomous. And some of their sub-values that you'll see reflected in their media choices are hedonism, which is an annoying academic way of saying they enjoy fun, mm -hmm. and uh, stimulation. So they like things that are very loud and that move quickly. The core narratives that engage them in their media, like manga, tend to be chaotic in nature. A lot happens. Magic is often real in those worlds that they like to occupy. And lots of if you say so's are heavy gamers. But here's what they're not, news consumers. Uh -huh. You can put an op-ed in the New York Times all day long and you are not going to make, if you say so, do a dang thing, because they're not there. 40% of Americans don't read the digital news on a, on a given day. So everybody in this room, I guarantee you, reads the news every day. You're in the 60%. The other 40%, often the 40% you wish you could communicate with, aren't there. So what I would recommend doing, and you can actually do this with some of the resources we have on some of our websites, is actually just go watch the media they watch. Okay. You know what I love here is because I think we've said this a lot. I would say my husband would always say this. He's like eight out of 10 people are not consuming what you're consuming. So they don't know what you know. And so that's probably the biggest challenge is just to figure out this group, this if you say so group, I, this is what I'm walking away with today, more power about what I'm going to do with all of my friends and family who are in the if you say so group. Yes, you're going to go and you are going to watch some Joe Rogan. It's <laughs> going to happen. In fact, we find that Joe Rogan trends more people power than you'd expect, but you're also going to watch some Mr. Beast. And if you don't know who that is, you're gonna, um, you're going to watch SpongeBob SquarePants. You might watch a little, little Nas X singing some songs. The point isn't to engage with where they are politically because they're not. Like that's not what's important to them. What's important to that particular audience is what they are actually spending their time on, which is music, streaming TV, often creating their own media and art, and sometimes engaging in formal education. Okay, uh, this is pretty awesome. So we've got just a few minutes left. And Catherine, if you wanna pop on because you might have a question, mm -hmm. that'd be fantastic. Ricky, so what, 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 what am I, what do you, what do you want to leave us with? And Catherine, if you have a question, this is a great time. Yeah, I, I do watch SpongeBob. So what else would you recommend? So Squidworth is my favorite. My favorite is the post-it post note because it's such a great 
learning lesson. You remember the, the episode where he had a, 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 a SpongeBob had a post-it note and um, he wanted to get rid of it. And he made it to seem the most exciting thing in the whole world. And then to, to get Squid Bob to, to get it. <laughs> It's like my favorite episode. And then when he, and then when he got it, it wasn't that fun because it was SpongeBob that made the post-it note fun. Anyway, so you don't, so I'm just saying I watched that. So what else should I watch that to inform myself? All right. So if you watch that, you're probably also watching much of Adult Swim and you're familiar with yes. that kind of irreverent, uh, yes. humorous vibe. If you, I would also recommend that you spend a lot of time on YouTube consuming music. So this audience is spending a lot of time, like music is at the absolute center of their existence. This is an audience that engages with music, makes music, uses music to regulate their emotions. And the music I recommend, because it's going to help you all day, every day is lo-fi. If you have not listened to lo-fi hip hop to help you concentrate, you're missing something if you say so is figured out because it's like a big part of their everyday. I love it. No, I, I think you're, yeah, it's so great. No, I, I love it. I'll let you have the last word since uh, I'll give you the post-it note. Um, I think that the most important thing is something that my boss, Brian Winooski, who's my, who's our ED has said, which is that you go and you consume the media without an agenda. You just live like it, like they're living mm -hmm. with, with a complete understanding of where they're coming from. Because the goal is to intuit ways to connect your story to their story. And so that means approaching them, not just with compassion, but with respect. And mm -hmm. that's true for every audience we find consistently. It is easy to move every audience toward democracy if you know where they're coming from. Yeah, what they're digesting, right? Mm -hmm. It's really important. No doubt. This is pretty, this is pretty fantastic. And Ricky is going to stay with us in the after chat. And so, so I'm, he's going to be in the after chat. So I'm so excited about that. So um, I yeah, think that okay. I'll hand it over, I'll hand it over to yeah. you. Ricky, thank you so much. I love it. I love it. Um, all right. So I'm excited because I'd like to talk about Dobbs further by bringing up Heidi and Carrie Short. We have a great uh, want to talk to them about what's going down in Cova. Tell us about your exciting news. Is Carrie in the room? Is she a spotlighter? But let's talk about Dobbs hey. Short. Hello, welcome. So we started COVA Coalition, which stands for Coastal Virginia, COVA -COVA. Um, inspired by Network Nova. We wanted to start something down here. So Carrie called me up and said, what do you think? And I said, let's do it. And so we hit the ground running. I love it. Yes. Carrie, yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, as you know, we're all inspired by everything that Network Nova does. And so we were really happy to kind of become the guinea pigs, right? So we are an affiliate of Network Nova, which is super Ooh. exciting. I mean, so we're going to sort of be the eyes and ears and representatives down here in coastal Virginia to kind of connect and hopefully offer some more content to the Friday Power Lunch that may inspire some people down here in Southampton Roads and elsewhere in coastal Virginia. But yeah, we were pretty excited to get it off the ground. Yeah, Kara, well, first give your background about yourself and then how you got to this point of wanting to step back in. Right, so uh, I guess a lot of you all, I don't know if some of you might remember, I was involved with Network Nova and helped co-host the, the summit that came down here in Virginia Beach. Um, I've been an activist since a lot of us started in January, 2017 with the Women's March. And then I helped co-found an organization down here that really was working to get uh, people just little baby steps to get involved in activism. Um, sadly, like some other snowflake organizations, sadly, that 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 uh, held true, that metaphor. Um, and so people have been burning out on different levels and we needed a reboot. So, um, so I was really lucky that Heidi uh, was willing to jump in. At, she is amazing. She's sort of the She's sort of the younger media, social media savvy person. And I'm like the washed up white housewife. I, I wore mom jeans. I wore mom jeans the first time. Heidi's wearing them for the, for the, you know, she's wearing them now when they're cool again. So anyway, so yeah, so that's what I'm bringing to the table. I remember I mom it. jeans the first time around, but, uh, but yeah, that's I love what we're doing. Well, I love, so what we did in Network Nova is we, we really believe in Virginia's my district. We want to work across all of Virginia. In fact, Jennifer Wolfter just announced she's running out in rural Virginia. In, in rural, it's not rural Virginia, her district though, but it's out in rural Virginia, but she has a chance to win finally. And she emailed me today and it is really about us, you know, about talking about uh, she's running and she really needs support. 
And we believe that we need to all work together. So coming down to Virginia Beach and then working with you has been fantastic. We helped Aaron Rouse get elected down there. Yeah. Virginia Beach is where it's at. It's a hot crescent. And right. So this is a really yeah. good affiliation, really great rural Virginia and other parts of Virginia, we hope will join in and just it, it really is a great movement. So your first let's talk about your first initiative. You're going to get kicked kicking off here with Dobbs if we want to show the graphic. Sure. We um, we wanted to do something surrounding the one year date of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and there wasn't anything going on. We also didn't want it to clash with the Pride event that's in Norfolk, because we know that that is super popular event. So we're going to be holding it on Sunday, the 25th at 2 p.m. Um, at the federal courthouse in Norfolk, and we'll have um, Planned Parenthood will be there. Repro Rising will be there. Um, Hampton Roads Repro Reproductive Justice League will be there as well as Indivisible 757. And of course us at COVA Coalition. Um, we're working on getting electeds there to speak also. We have a couple confirmed so far, but um, the sign up link is in the chat and you can also find us on all our social medias if you guys will follow us there and help us grow our audience. That'd be amazing. So if you've got friends down in um, Southeastern Virginia, please let them know that we are around COVA Coalition. We're a new organization as a Network Nova affiliate. We've got a <laughs> website. Um, we're very happy that uh, Network Nova is giving us the infrastructure that we need. You'd be uh, anybody who wants to start a new grassroots group. You know, you can we, we can tell you there's some infrastructure needs, and the and the fact that Network Nova has that. The, the capacity to help us with our mailing list, the capacity to help us with media. It's it's really great. And I think hopefully we're going to establish this model and some other groups might get, you know, bubbling up from other areas in Virginia to kind of take that network Nova model statewide. Ooh. I love it. I love it. I know it's really great. It's very exciting. I'm at Cova, I might be thinking Coca-Cola, Co Cova. Now in right. the Nova. Okay, great. Well, well you know, we can't decide what we're called down here. Yeah. You know, are we Hampton Road? Cova seems to be like the hot thing. Like Coastal it. Virginia, that's us. So if you or anybody, you know, is around, we are doing our rally on Sunday. Time to stand great. up for reproductive freedom. Now, and also if you have from if you want in the chat, how do people get a hold of you to join the Cova Coalition? Um, and, you know, I just am very excited and I think we're growing something. It's taken seven years, but that's how, you know, organizing takes a long time. It's hard work. It's really about relationships. We are so thrilled to have met you, you know, so many years ago. And this is what it takes. It's, it's the long game. It's building and building and building and building relationship and trust. So thank you, Carrie, for being in the room today. I know that you're probably tired after the primary. Working oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well not just that we got the pride fest and then the blue yeah. gala it's just weird i don't even know where i don't even know very excited i'll sleep on monday we'll sleep on monday yeah sleep yeah and i want to say that it's district 52 that jennifer woofter is running in so if uh throw some love to jennifer mm -hmm. she was just so excited to like david said we have to run everywhere and that means looking at the whole house of delegates so we will be um, very excited. So bye, Carrie. Thank you for coming today. Great to see you. All right. So what a great show. What a fantastic show. Stay in the after chat with us because I do want to really go over some of our election results. I think there's so much to talk about. And it was incredible, a credible statement for where we're heading for in this primary and our brand and how just awesome uh, Virginia Democratic Democratic people are and power to us and power to the people and power to this team. I want to say thank you to everybody on the team uh, today, just rowing together to get this this done. I want to you know thank you to everybody and thank you to our guest David Pepper, Ricky Conray. That was really interesting, by the way, and I'm glad you're staying afterwards. So um, let's say let's get to the other side. And next week we're going to do a lot more with some of our primary winners. So stay tuned. We'll have be having that on the show and just get your ticket for the Women's Summit. Hopefully you'll do the challenge. We'll have some winners to announce next week. Who wouldn't want a signed copy of David Pepper's book? Um, so yeah, thank you everybody. And, and also our summer interns, this is their second show. Say wave to everybody. Allison Bonnier is here and Claire, ciao. So thank you for being here and we'll see you on the other side.